Hi, everyone. Welcome to Mob Mentality. This is the podcast for moms of busy babies. And we have Kristen Mallon with us. She is a woman's longevity health expert, and she is the co-founder of Femgevity. She has all kinds of awesome things to share with us today. And I am most excited to get into talking about hormones, menopause, and also how that plays a role in anxiety. If you wouldn't mind introducing yourself. So I'm a certified nurse midwife. I've been one for almost 18 years. I have four little kids and I've been working in women's health for even longer than that. Like, so like 25 years and it's really my passion. I love working with women. I love working with moms and I love working with optimizing health. So that's really why I started Femgevity is I really wanted to find a way to help women, not just like, you know, in, in medicine and healthcare, we have so much of sick care. Like, are you sick? No. Okay. Come back next year. But I really wanted to kind of change the narrative in medicine to more about, well, not, are you sick, but is my health optimal? Like, what can I do to make my health optimal? Like, okay, my lab values are normal, but are my lab values optimal? And so that's really why Michelle and I, my co-founder started Femgevity is really to kind of help those women who are really seeking those questions and really kind of want a little bit more from their medical team that I think traditionally they were going to allied health professionals for like chiropractors and nutritionists and Mm -hmm. like holistic health coaches. But sometimes it's really nice to get that from medicine. Like, is my health optimal from medicine? Yes. I, what I took away from that is just being so proactive instead of reactive. You said, it's like, we go in expecting when we're like when we're sick that's the only time anyone visits the doctor it's like how much more powerful would it be if you could go into a doctor's office and actually feel really good about the visit yeah or just be like okay well what do i need to do to prevent heart disease like i have heart disease in my family like what do i need to do to prevent heart disease or i have a family history of cancer or alzheimer's dementia or any type of metabolic disease and there's things that we can do decades before they can become an issue And then what if you could start doing that? I mean, it's just kind of like saving for retirement, you know, like if you started saving for retirement in your teens or your twenties versus Mm -hmm. your fifties, like how much better off we are when we're in our eighties and nineties and health is the same way. You said some big words there that are big and they're scary. What are, can you give us even just like two or three things that you would automatically say like right off that you could do to help prevent some of those really scary diseases? So whether it's popular or not, nobody loves this answer and everybody loves this answer, but Mm -hmm. exercise. So the answer is really exercise, exercise, exercise. So exercise is usually like one to five times more effective than the pill for whatever disease fill in the blank that runs in your family health history, cancer, heart disease, dementia. Mm -hmm. It's probably the number one, two, and three thing that needs to be done in order to prevent any type of catastrophic health event. And also, because people are like, well, you do longevity medicine and you do preventative medicine, but like, I don't really want to live longer. Like my mom was in a nursing home for 10 years or 20 years, or my grandma, my aunt, this was, you know, old and they didn't have a great life. And so it's not just about like prolonging health span. It's also about prolonging lifespan and and living better longer. Mm -hmm. And so exercise is 100% going to give you the best bang for your buck. And I think like, it's hard to get that right. Sometimes I think we sometimes gravitate towards certain types of exercise. Mm -hmm. And it's really like kind of a mix of all the four, I always say there's four pillars of exercise. Okay, it's really about like, high intensity interval training. So really pushing endurance. It's also about low intensity steady state. So not going above a aerobic zone, like where your cardiac workload is really more than your aerobic capacity can handle from an oxygen perspective, and also flexibility and support and then weights. So some people do like two out of those four really well. Mm -hmm. And then so it's really kind of having a well rounded approach to all four of those things. After that, it's diet. Okay. Whenever you said even exercise, I automatically, like, I'll raise my hand and be the first one to be like, okay, I know exactly where I'm lacking at from what you said. Flexibility is not my thing. And I could definitely spend some more time there. So just even being able, I'd love that you said those four pillars. And just even if you're already active, being able to look at where's the area to be better. 
and to improve my health even more. So thank you. Those are awesome. So nutrition, what's your thoughts there? Yeah. So this is something that we really like to do a lot of at Femgevity actually. So we do okay. a lot of types of very specific precision medicine testing. Mm -hmm. I think that we're going to look into the future and we're going to kind of look back on this time and be like, wow, can you believe that everyone was touting like this diet and that diet and South beach and keto and, you know, low carb and high fat, low fat. And without having the data to back it up, that that's really what's good or best for any given individual. Mm -hmm. And so at Femgevity, we, we do precision med medicine testing to kind of find out, well, what's best for your genome and what's best for your micronutrient deficiencies in terms of how do you metabolize all different types of vitamins and mineral minerals? What does your gut microbiome testing tell us about what your diet's doing to you? And then how do we optimize what you're eating and not just what you're eating in your diet, but also like nutrients and supplements mm -hmm. to make sure that you're getting like the optimal amounts of everything. Because most people are running deficient in something when it comes to nutrients, especially like the way we farm and, and our food and, and, you know, not trying to be political, but just kind of the way our food is sourced. I mean, such a high level, so many people at once, we used to farm really small, really local, mm -hmm. really nutrient packed. And it, it's just hard to do that on such a large scale. So um, it, there's a lot that kind of goes into, into diet. It can, it can get really, really specific and really, we can get really, really niche down Mm -hmm. um, on an individual level, and like what's what's best for each person. That's exciting for somebody that m may really be struggling in multiple areas of life to know how much their nutrition can have an impact on just their mental clarity, their actual energy levels, maybe even like from a reproductive standpoint totally. of what's getting in their way. Because it seems like those things are so much more of an issue now. And do you contribute a lot of that to how our food? is like where we're getting our food from. I mean, even in kids. So like I said, we won't go too political with things. You're right. But even with our children now, it's like the obesity rates are, I mean, sky high in young kids. And then even mental health issues are huge in adolescence right now. So do you contribute any of that to like a lack of exercise, nutrition, where our food is actually coming from, what we're eating? Yeah, definitely. So I find that a lot of it has to do with the high level of processed food and the high level of preservatives that's found in our food. So really to like extend, you know, nothing bad, but like really just to extend the shelf life. And then so that extension of shelf life is now wreaking havoc in our liver. And then when our liver can't process, food, it's spending so much time processing the preservatives, it can't really absorb the nutrients in, in the best way. And then it can't really process glucose and glycogen. And so that's where we get all of this kind of shut down of a lot of the metabolism and, and the multiple health systems. And so there's general things that are really great for everybody. And then there are there's the precision, the precision medicine side of things mm -hmm. where you can get really, really specific about what's best for you. Um, and you can do things like allergy testing and, and stool sample testing to be like, okay, well, you know, you don't have an allergy per se to gluten or dairy or pineapple or mangoes or pine nuts, but you have a sensitivity and then that sensitivity is causing your gut to have an allergic response, which is breaking down the epithelial lining, lining in the gut and causing you to have these reactions. Generally speaking, I mean, it's great to have, you know, whenever you're going to eat a peel, to have organic as much as possible when it comes to fruits and vegetables. And if you don't have the ability to have organic, like to make sure we're washing our fruits and vegetables as much as possible and to have things that have sh the shorter, the sh I always say the shorter the shelf life, the better. And then if we can't get organic meats and cheeses, to look for those meats and cheeses that like don't have hormones, don't have additives, you know, are, are try as much as possible to be pasture fed and, you know, be mindful of like what's going into the animals that we eat. If, if we choose to eat animals, you know, some people mm -hmm. are vegan, totally valid choice too. Yeah. And so it's, I think that those are like a really kind of basic rudimentary ways to kind of like go back to how we ate, you know, a, even just a hundred years ago, even just 50 years ago, can be like really, really helpful and less sugars and less um, carbohydrates. You know, we're eating, I think it's like 35% more carbohydrates, like at every meal. So it's not even just like in a day, but like every single meal wow. than we did even like 40, 50 years ago. So I think that that's kind of, those are like just basic general things that can help with prolonging longevity and ultimately help with hormone balance altogether. Ugh. 
so many good things there. I'm like, I feel like I could just dig into so many areas, but so shorter shelf life is better. I feel like that's just simple for people to remember. So if it has a short shelf life, it's basically a thumbs up. That's a win for us. And then why is it so important, even if we can't buy organic, but just to wash your fruits and vegetables it may sound like a silly question, but why is that yeah, important? I mean, that's where pesticides lie. And that's where anything, any treatment that's going to have been in, not just on the plant itself and on the leaves itself, but also on the soil. Um, they do, they do, um, like they call it organic light or like off label organic. Mm -hmm. um, where the food is technically organic, but they don't go through the process of getting the certification. And so it's okay. not as expensive as organic food and it's just as good. Have you noticed any changes since you've been in healthcare for so long, any changes to women? And even when they're going through menopause, does it seem like the age is moving up? Uh, like what's, what's kind of going on there? Yeah. So I think one of the really big changes that I've noticed about menopause and perimenopause specifically is that women are having babies older mm -hmm. and especially like in my practice, like I still see pregnant women. And so like, I'll look at a panel on any given day and, and some of the, sometimes the, the women that I work with will like, will play a game and we'll be like, is anyone under 35 going to be on our panel today? And we'll look and we'll be like, no. And, and so I live near New York city. So I think like sometimes big cities, the women tend to be a little bit older. Mm -hmm. The average age I think in the USA is like uh, 27 or 28 for oh, having wow. their first baby. But in large major metropolitan cities like Los Angeles, Boston, New York, it's 32 to have the, okay. their first baby. I'm along that path of things. Yeah, so exactly, I waited till yeah. later. Yeah, exactly. So I think a lot of women do that are now kind of having postpartum symptoms and perimenopausal symptoms at the same time. Wow. Because perimenopause, so if you look at fertility charts, progesterone, which is the first hormone that actually starts to go down in perimenopause, starts to decrease at 31. And so this is why we start to see infertility rise at 31. And we start to see um, like IVF rates start to go up at 31. Okay. And then DHEA is like the next hormone with testosterone that starts to go down in the 30s. And so women that are having babies at 38 and 40 and 42 and 44, they're actually experiencing postpartum hormonal shifts and perimenopause hormonal shifts like at the same time. And this is, I think, an entirely, entirely new phenomenon that I think was very atypical 30 years ago. The, this is super interesting. I feel yeah. like I know about both of these areas, but never really thought about them coming together. And I think that like, po I really feel like there needs to be a totally separate, um, like, I, you know, I don't love labels or classifications, but I mm -hmm. feel like there should be a total separate category for women who are 38 to 46, maybe mm -hmm. that give birth because I think they experience postpartum hormonal shifts more severely. I think they, they, it hits them more severely because it's like postpartum and perimenopause mixed together. I obviously look at them very, very differently and I treat them very, very differently and I support them and their hormonal shifts and their hormonal balances. And what I offer them is very different than if someone was 27, okay. maybe even experiencing the same exact symptoms. If they came in and they said the same exact symptoms and they rated them exactly the same way, I would definitely kind of just maybe approach it a little bit differently. Um, not to say that the ultimate treatment wouldn't be the same, you know, everyone is very unique and individual, mm -hmm. but I think that if we kind of like just start to bring awareness to this concept, it might help practitioners and OBGYNs and midwives kind of just look at this class of women and, and give them a little bit more support and, and offer them a little bit more options. What would be some of those options? Yeah. So, um, mainly, mainly progesterone okay. support progesterone enhancement, which can be done in a multitude of different ways, um, DHEA support, um, and DHEA probably boosting. And so there's okay. so many different ways to do this. Also, there's a ton of supplements that also help to help the body like reabsorb its own estrogen. And there's such little estrogen that's being produced in the postpartum period, especially when it will, and also in the perimenopausal period, it's a lot of shifting estrogen. Mm -hmm. um, and then especially when a woman's breastfeeding. So kind of using like what we would use in perimenopause in the postpartum period during this time, that's absolutely totally safe for breastfeeding. So a lot of bioidenticals or nutraceuticals, or there's a lot of herbs that we use that are safe for breastfeeding to kind of boost progesterone and support progesterone and support DHEA 
and balance estrogen levels out to kind of give women relief from like vaginal dryness and lack of sleep, brain fog, like that mommy brain feeling, um, the anxiety that I think a lot of women, which you mentioned in the beginning of the show, like mm-hmm. a lot of women experience like more severely. I, I find more reports, I feel, of postpartum anxiety the older a woman is when she has a baby. And I think because it's tied to perimenopause and the loss of progesterone that's happening naturally from perimenopause. Um, there's so many different ways to support this balance um, from so many different sources. And usually we can find something that a woman's really comfortable with. Oh my gosh. Like I know so many people are going to be reaching out to you after this. Yeah, and I like, hope so. Yeah. All these things are just going off in my mind. And is so if somebody is not local, I saw even on your Instagram that you can do telehealth visits. Is this something that they can actually do from a remote standpoint is be able to get more in-depth testing and things with you? Yes, absolutely. So um, our website is femgevityhealth.com. Okay. Um, we do have telemedicine visits. Um, we're in all 50 states. Um, we have okay. cer- certain prescribing restrictions depending on what state you're in. So it depends on like what we can prescribe based on what state you're in, but certainly from um, a counseling perspective and from a recommendation perspective, we're not limited by state. And so we can absolutely um, walk someone through whatever journey or whatever process they're going through and make recommendations based on where they're at. Women that are entering menopause and they're dealing with a lot of anxiety. Mm-hmm. And I want to know your thoughts on it's like, okay, which one kind of comes first? Because so even a client, for instance, that I have, it's like she talks a lot about going through hot flashes and, you know, she knows she has some hormonal issues and stuff going on. And then she's like, okay, I have hot flashes. And then I notice when I start having hot flashes, then I become really anxious. So she's like, we're like, which one comes first? Yeah. So usually, so anxiety is, I think, absolutely very poorly treated when it comes to perimenopause and menopause. And I think that we are definitely over prescribing traditional psychotherapy and traditional pharmacologic therapy. So SSRIs and SNRIs Mm -hmm. for women that are in menopause. And it's kind of like numbing them or dulling them, but it's not really helping them per se so much because really like what's happening is they're struggling with the shifting hormone balances and the shifting hormone changes. So like I said in the beginning, like when a woman starts to go into perimenopause, it's by the time a woman is 40 years old, she's lost 80% of her progesterone of when she was in her twenties. And nobody really talks about progesterone and progesterone support throughout the Mm forties. And so then you're losing progesterone all throughout your forties. And then that's a progesterone is the hormone that really helps you to regulate sleep and it helps you to okay. regulate metabolism. So you're losing, you're like slowly leaking out sleep, like the way you, a, a, an air mattress would like leak out air. Like you don't really realize it. And then all of a sudden you wake up and you're on the floor kind of thing. So over 10 years, you're like leaking out sleep. And then this lead, this contributes to that brain fog, anxiety feeling, or that confusion feeling where like women will now get into their late forties or fifties. And they'll be like, oh, I can't remember where I put my keys. And like, oh, I walked into the room and I can't remember what I walked into the room for. And that's because for the last six or seven years, they've actually had complete sleep deprivation or deep sleep deprivation, and they didn't really know it. And then now you get into your 50s, and then your estrogen starts to go down. So this is the last hormone in in all of kind of the feminine hormone cascade that starts to drop. Although this is the hormone that everybody kind of focuses on, because this is where all the symptoms kind of start. This is where the hot flashes start. And this is where like the night sweats start. And this is where kind of like the very significant mood changes really come into play. But it's Mm -hmm. really accumulation of what's been happening for the last kind of like five or seven years in the perimenopause time. And estrogen is really kind of going up and down, like up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down, like very significant heavy swings. And so without kind of leveling out estrogen and done lots of different ways, you don't have to take HRT. You absolutely can take HRT. You can take bioidenticals, you can take nutraceuticals, you can do gut microbiome balancing. There's non-hormonal ways to balance, there's non-hormonal ways to balance estrogen. But by balancing estrogen, you're no longer having these very significant up and down estrogens. Okay. And that's going to minimize that like anxiety feeling that a woman has and, and minimize that feeling of um, 
of like the, the hot flashes and the anxiousness. The the great thing to do would be to supp to support and supplement that progesterone. Progesterone is very high up in the sex steroid hormone cascade, and okay. progesterone actually can produce estrogen. So when we when we support estrogen, so, uh, when we support progesterone, it actually can produce and balance estrogen into the 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 menopausal period. So really, I think like what's happening is that like no one's been talking about menopause. No one's talking about perimenopause. Women were yo-yoed around about whether or not HRT was good for them. It, HRT meaning hormone replacement therapy. Mm -hmm. We were told in the 60s, femme fatale, we were going to live forever. Then we were told in 2002 it was going to cause breast cancer. Then we were told that was wrong. Then we were like, oh, go back to estrogen. It's fine. So women have been yo-yoed around. But they don't really know. Is it good? Is it not good? And practitioners have been yo-yoed around. They don't really know mm -hmm. is it good or is it not good. So we have enough yo-yoing going on in our own body. We don't need anything else. <laughs> exactly. We need some answers. Exactly. So um, unless you have an expert like myself or somebody who's actually taken the time to become a menopausal or a perimenopausal expert and understand like what is the truth? Like what does the science say? And that's the thing about what I love about science is science is very good at, at proving us wrong because it, it leads you to the empirical truth. Mm -hmm. Unless you have someone telling you exactly what the truth is, you, you don't really know, like, what should I do? What should I not do? So because there's been no one to really kind of educate us about how to manage our 40s hormonally, we're left suffering with anxiety and night sweats and hot flashes and and kind of this very, like, lost time in our 50s. And that's really what we're working to solve with Femgevity Health. I'm so glad that you're working to solve that because even as you're talking, I'm like, oh my gosh, this is a lot. Like being a woman is hard. Yeah. <laughs> like there's a lot that goes on yeah. in our bodies and there's so much for us to understand. And I believe so many people just do not have the awareness on what all is actually happening in our body and the steps that we can take to live. You said even optimally, like live more comfortably in our own skin and how that would change our relationship so much, our relationship with ourselves, our relationships with our families, the people that we care most about. Because I know when I'm at a heightened sense of anxiety and not feeling well, I am certainly not the best for anybody else in my household. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, and a lot of it is coming from what's happening to the brain for the years in our 40s um, because of the loss of DHEA, testosterone, progesterone. That's, you know, very unobserved. I mean, when you look at any other hormone imbalance or hormone, like for example, diabetes. So okay. a lot of times people who are diabetic, they have no idea their sugars could be 400 and they have no idea until they go to the doctor. And the same thing is happening here with women. Women's hormones are very abnormal. They're in very, very abnormal zones, like abnormally high or abnormally low. Like with estrogen, estrogen can be very abnormally high and low, like very erratic. Mm -hmm. And progesterone, DHA, testosterone can be very, very, very low. And women don't really realize it until symptoms start. And it's been going, it's a chronic condition that's been going on for usually many, 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 many years. And then that condition is what leads to the, the buildup in the brain. And then ultimately all these symptoms of the insomnia, the brain fog, the anxiety, the depression, the confusion, and the even rage. There's so many symptoms that come from this time in a woman's life, for sure. And it really should, I really believe it should be treated with hormonal support. Is there anything that we can do to help balance our hormones that's even not, I know you said there's different like herbs and things that we can do. Like what's something that somebody could go and take action with and like either incorporate more into their day, even like specifically certain things with nutrition um, and even outside of exercise that you would recommend that would help us feel more regulated? Yeah. So one of the things like when women are like, I don't want to take anything hormonally, like I really don't want to do anything that's like, I want what's natural. Um, so one of the things that I recommend is gut microbiome balancing. So by balancing the gut microbiome, this is really like the best way to land naturally. So natural is to let all your hormones go down to zero and to age and to, to get wrinkles and to lose sexual libido. And that's natural. And death is natural. And these are all natural things. And some mm -hmm. women, that is the path they want to choose. And 
that is an absolutely totally valid choice and a valid path. But for women who want to prolong or want a natural, want a more gradual process and a slower process and kind of a slower come down into aging Mm -hmm. hormones, either through nutraceuticals, herbs, supplements, bioidenticals, or hormone replacement is really the way to go. But if you Mm -hmm. want to avoid all of that, gut microbiome balancing is going to give you the cleanest and clearest way for your body to kind of do it in a way that is kind of like, you know, like a, like a plumbing that has no clogs, like, or a, like a tube, like a, like an artery that has no blocks. Mm -hmm. And it's going to be kind of like the gentlest come down. That's the most natural. Where's the places that our listeners can connect with you? Yeah. So definitely on femgevityhealth.com. Um, okay. They can always email us at hello at femgevityhealth.com. And we're on all the social media channels um, on Instagram at femgevity, Facebook at femgevity, um, TikTok at femgevity, LinkedIn at femgevity. I mean, we're really pretty much everywhere that we possibly can be. And we really want to try to be as accessible as possible because there's a lot of noise nowadays, like, Mm -hmm. and we know we have really something valuable to say specifically about perimenopause, menopause, really women like 40 plus or 38 plus when it comes to hormonal shifts. And that does include postpartum hormonal shifts, um, especially because women 38 plus have babies. So, um, We really just want to try to like be as available to answer questions as much as possible. We actually also do a live Q and a on Instagram every Monday night at eight 30 Eastern. Oh, that's great. Anybody wants to come on and ask a question. Like we answer all of the questions live. Ooh, I love that resource right there. And I have to know what is a recent mom victory for you that you've had? So uh, (laughs) I just took my kids to the grand Canyon. Oh, that's awesome. Did they love it? Uh, yeah, you know, my kids are little. So I mean, my, not little, but my oldest is 12. My youngest is seven. So they, you know, they were like, cool. And like, I'd never been. So like, I mm-hmm. was like, so excited to go. And I was like, this is gonna be so amazing. And like, my excitement was like a level 11. And they, because yeah. you know, we, we do a lot of nature things. And they were just like, <laughs> more nature, cool. <laughs> So, massive nature exactly they were like oh it's just like a hole in the ground all right this I think is a- like, as they go to other canyons they're gonna be like oh it's it's not as big as that other canyon that we went <laughs> like they'll look back on it and be like oh that canyon was pretty massive well I think the mom win of getting because you have four kids right yeah getting four kids to the Grand Canyon is Thanks. a win in itself <laughs> Thanks. Well, thank you so much for joining us. This was awesome. I'm excited to have you back again. If 